very good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you for taking time out and and logging in. Just yeah. Uh, we appreciate all of your continuous support and encouragement that helps us to do study, bring different subjects, uh, and in turn study together. Good evening, Mr. Vincent Chan. Good to see you here. And to start, uh, may I request Uncle Sanjeevara, if you would please pray for the session. Why are you are asking me? You are in the center of my screen and my screen is glowing up with the yellow this thing around you. So, so you are the one. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not able to speak anyway. A short prayer, please. Thank you. Uh, only Father, we thank you, Father, for this opportunity so that we meet together, discuss important things, Lord. Be with us as we listen to your servant. Help us to understand your word and help us to practice it. Especially help us to understand what is right, what is wrong. Uh, we want to uh, obey you, Lord, in everything according to the word of God. So help us to learn more about you and your word. Be with uh, Mr. Sachin so that whatever he speaks, Lord, help, help him to speak your word. Bless him. I pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Mr. Rao. Uh, yep. Indeed, uh, Bible study is uh, a journey, right? It's it's a journey where we we explore and transform our relationship with God. We know Him more and more, and that revelation of who He is change our way of looking at Him, change our very relationship with Him, and that relationship, which is rightly a response to His love, I think it changes everything. And that response with love uh, brings a lot of responsibilities uh, as we live our daily life. And uh, as you know, I am doing the series on the survey of the New Testament books. Uh, and last time when we were doing this survey, uh, Mr. Rao shared the input that we should focus more on the on on the practical aspect or application that is covered by the author in his book or epistle. Also, of course, along with the survey things like where it was written, when it was written, what circumstances were there, but also for, put more focus on the application side, what, what theological theme the author was trying to bring and what it could mean to us. So with that uh, light, We'll do our study today. Today, of course, we are doing the survey on the book uh, or the epistle of Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi, that is Philippians. So I'll share my screen and we'll get started. So let's get started. Uh, so the book of Philippians or the epistle of Apostle Paul to the church uh, and uh, in Philippi, that is the Philippians, the letter to Philippians. So now on his second missionary journey, Paul founded the church in Philippi. Basically, let's go here. Yeah. yeah. Then his mission in the city landed both himself and Silas in jail after having beaten and publicly dishonored. 
when apostle paul writes to philippian church he is again a prisoner and this time he is in the prison in rome now the persecution he endured in philippi is now also the experience of philippian believers so that's the theme you will see uh, living in persecution and yet living with joy looking at the lord so that's now we see that the experience that he endured is now also the experience of the philippian believers now despite the pain he and his first reader suffer the philippian letter is filled with tremendous joy now the word joy is mentioned for about 12 times in his letter and then apostle paul pens down one of the best known word from this letter can you guess that is rejoice in the lord always rejoice in the lord always while being bound with chains and wondering whether he will live or die yet he says rejoice in the lord always and i think the the song rejoice in the lord always rejoice i think that it has been such a common song uh, encouraging all of us that's the amazing thing that apostle paul introduces to to his uh, recipients of the letter despite being in the prison now <clears throat> he calls the philippian church not to be afraid of their adversaries he tells them not to be afraid of their adversary but to understand that it has been granted to you he write it has been granted to you on behalf of christ not only to believe in him but also to suffer for him yeah amazing uh, um, relation he bring not only we believe in him but we also suffer for him now even though paul wrote philippians from jail it is is considered as his one of the most positive um, letter when we consider the long standing impact of paul's prison epistles it might seem that he did more good in jail than in outside just uh, a figure of speech but i hope that none of us have to go to jail but i also hope that if we do we will use our time and experience as well as what apostle paul did now we don't want adversaries but if and when they come we don't want adversaries but if and when they come may god help us to endure them grow from them and use them to help others grow too just as apostle paul did now martin luther king junior did one of his most famous writing from jail uh author and and theologian ernest kasemann and dietrich bonhoeffer wrote books while they were in nazi prisons john bunyan and cory ten boom also used their prison experiences well now adversaries of various type can help us minister to the hurting as well as to those who are comfortable so that's the beauty of sharing our ad uh, adversities now let's see a little bit about the city and the church where apostle paul writes this letter so the city of philippi now paul arrived at philippi after crossing the aegean sea during his second missionary journey so apparently if you follow this yellow line you can see his journey and this is where he is philippi he and his companions that is silas timothy and luke had set sail from troas to philippi port neopolis which is somewhere here now from neopolis paul and his companion traveled to philippi so you can see from uh, it's a small little distance to the left <clears throat> located some 10 miles or 16 kilometer island 
Now, when Romans defeated the Macedonian Empire in the mid second century BC, Philippi, the city was named after the father of Alexander the Great. It came under Roman control. Now, the Roman divided the former uh, uh, Macedonian kingdom into four districts and Philippi was located in the first district. Although the principal city, that's the major city, was Amphipolis in that region. Now, let's see what is the setting. What were the circumstances in the Philippians? Now, Luke tells us the story of founding the Philippian church in Acts chapter 16. Paul arrived in the city around AD 49 or 50 after visiting the churches in Syria and Asia Minor, where he delivered the decree of the Jerusalem Council. Now, the, about Jerusalem Council, we read it in Acts chapter 15, uh, then uh, verse 36 to 40 and 41. And in chapter 16 as well. Now, Paul headed east down to the Sicilian road to the Roman province of Asia. That is, Ephesus was likely his goal. But was kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Now, Silas accompanied Paul. And since he was a prophet, the prohibition was likely communicated through him. Likewise, the spirit of Jesus did not allow Paul to head north of the province of Bithynia and Pontus. So, he, Silas and Timothy traveled to the western port of Thraos. Now, this city, Philippi, was a Roman colony and known as one of the great seas, uh, seaports of antiquity having a population of around 30,000 to 100,000. Now, in a vision, Paul saw a Macedonian man uh, urging him to travel to Macedonia to help them. Now, the author, Plutarch, he noted that at the end of the first century, it was a popular belief at that time that it is only in sleep that a man receive inspiration from on high. It was a belief that type. So Paul and his companion responded to this vision as divine summon and embarked by sea sailing to the west of Macedonia. Now, how is the outline of the uh, letter? So, of course, it started with the epistolary greeting, that is greeting um, uh, in the letter. Then Apostle Paul goes on to thanksgiving and prayer for the Philippians, all the church members. And then the body of the letter starts. So first, uh, he talks about his imprisonment, his anticipated, uh, anticipated release. And he is not sure whether he will live or will be executed. Now he put his focus on to the church, the church members, and then he calls for a unity, which follows by a call of a unity. Then he gives them the example of Christ, follow Christ for unity. And then when you follow the example of Christ, he thus says that our conduct should reflect the example of Christ. Then he goes on to give the commendation for Timothy and Ephroditus. Then he comes to handle some of the challenges that is happening there in the church. That is warning against incursion of the Judaizers. And I, we saw in great detail in Galatians how these Jews who were following Jesus were asking the Gentiles to follow the Jewish tradition and custom in order to be called as the people of God. Okay. So then he says how to how to reject them, and then he goes on to do uh, does his final exhortation, the message in which he says stand firm, be united, and follow Paul's teaching and his example. And then he thanks the church for their generosity. Now having seen this, now let's get 
a little deeper into the details of the letter. And for that, we will watch the video from the Bible Project about Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So I have enabled the sound. I hope it should sound. Paul's letter to the Philippians. The church in Philippi was the first Jesus community Paul started in Eastern Europe, and that story is told in Acts chapter 16. Philippi was a Roman colony in ancient Macedonia. It was full of retired soldiers, and it was known for its patriotic nationalism. And so there Paul faced resistance when he was announcing Jesus as the true king of the world. And after Paul moved on from there, those who became followers of Jesus continued to suffer resistance and even persecution. But they remained a vibrant community faithful to the way of Jesus. Paul sent this letter from one of his many imprisonments, and for a very practical reason. The Philippians had sent one of their members, Epaphroditus, to take a financial gift to Paul to support him in prison. And Paul sent back this letter with Epaphroditus to say thank you and to do a whole lot more. The design of this letter doesn't develop one single idea from beginning to end like many of Paul's other letters. Rather, Paul has arranged a series of short, reflective essays or vignettes, and they all revolve around the center of gravity in this letter, which is a poem in chapter 2. It artistically retells the story of the Messiah's incarnation, his life, death, and resurrection, and exaltation. And then in each of these vignettes, Paul will take up key words or ideas from that poem to show how living as a Christian means seeing your own story as a lived expression of Jesus' story. So Paul opens the letter with a prayer of gratefulness, and he thanks God for the Philippians' generosity, for their faithfulness, and he expresses his confidence that the life-transforming work that God has begun in them will continue into greater and more beautiful expressions of faithfulness and love. And Paul then focuses on their obvious concern at the moment, which is his status in prison. Being in a Roman prison was no picnic, but it paradoxically has turned out for good to advance the good news about Jesus. So all of the Roman guards, the administrators, they all know that Paul's in prison for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And his imprisonment, it's inspired confidence in other Christians to talk about Jesus more openly. And Paul's optimistic that he will be released from prison, but it's possible that he could be executed. And as he reflects on it, that actually wouldn't be so bad, because for me, Paul says, life is the Messiah. And so dying would be a gain. For Paul, his life in the present and in the future, it's defined by the life and love of Jesus for him. And so if he's executed, that means he'll be present with Jesus, which would be great for him. And if he's released, well, that would mean he could keep working to start more Jesus communities, which would be better for other people. And so that's what he hopes for. And notice how his train of thought works here. Dying for Jesus is not the true sacrifice for Paul. Rather, it's staying alive to serve others. And so that's Paul's way of participating in the story of Jesus, to suffer in order to love others more than himself. Paul then turns to the Philippians and he urges them to participate in Jesus' example by taking up the same mindset. He says, your life as citizens should be consistent with the good news about the Messiah. So these Christians in Philippi, they were living in a hotbed of Roman patriotism. But their way of life was to be shaped by another king, Jesus. And that might bring persecution, but they are not to be afraid because suffering for being associated with Jesus, it's a way of living out the story of Jesus himself. Which leads Paul into the great poem of chapter 2. It's rich with echoes of Old Testament texts, specifically the story of Adam and his rebellion in Genesis 1 through 3, and the poems about the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. This poem is worth committing to memory. It is a beautifully condensed version of the gospel story. So before before becoming human, the Messiah pre-existed in a state of glory and equality with God. And unlike Adam, who tried to seize equality with God, the Messiah chose not to exploit his equal status for his self-advantage. Rather, he emptied himself of status. He became a human. He became a servant to all. And even more than that, he allowed himself to be humiliated. He was obedient to the Father by going to his death on a Roman execution rack. 
But through God's power and grace, the Messiah's shameful death has been reversed through the resurrection. And now God has highly exalted Jesus as the King of all, bestowing upon him the name that is above all names, so that all creation should recognize that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that last statement is astounding. Paul's quoting from Isaiah chapter 45. It's a passage where all creation comes to recognize the God of Israel as Lord. Paul's point here is very clear. In the crucified and risen Jesus, we discover that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Lord Jesus. And so for Paul, this poem, it expresses his convictions about who Jesus is, and it does more. It offers the example of Jesus as a way of life that his followers are to imitate. And so that's why Paul immediately goes on to tell two stories, first about Timothy, then about Epaphroditus, because they are both examples of people living out Jesus' story. So Timothy's like Jesus because he's constantly concerned for the well-being of other people more than his own. And Epaphroditus, who the Philippians sent with their gift, he ended up risking his life to serve Paul in prison. He got so sick he almost died trying to help Paul. But God had mercy on him and Paul by sparing him the loss of a friend. And Paul's point here is that these are the kinds of people who are living, breathing examples of the story of Jesus and they are worthy of imitation. Paul then turns to his own story as an example. So those Christians who had been demanding circumcision of non-Jewish Christians, remember his letter to the Galatians, these people are still stirring up trouble for Paul and they keep reminding him of his own past. When he used to persecute Jesus' followers, when he tried to show his right standing before God by his zealous obedience to the laws of the Torah. But like Jesus, Paul has given up all of that status and privilege. He now regards all of it as filth. And the word he uses is actually much less polite. He's given it all up to become a servant, like Jesus, to participate in his suffering and sacrificial love. And he does all of it in the hope that Jesus' love will carry him through death and out the other side into resurrection. So Paul says that for followers of Jesus, their true citizenship is in heaven. Which for Paul does not mean that we should all hope to get away from earth and go to heaven one day. Rather, heaven is the transcendent place where Jesus reigns as king. And he says we're eagerly awaiting our royal savior to come from there and return here. To bring his kingdom of healing justice and transforming love to bring about a new creation. Paul then challenges the Philippians to keep living out the Jesus story. He first addresses two prominent women leaders in the church who worked alongside Paul, and they're in some kind of conflict. And so Paul pleads with them to follow Jesus' example of humility, to reconcile and become unified. Paul then urges the Philippians not to give in to fear, but despite their persecution, to vent all of their emotion and their needs to God, who will give them peace. And that peace, Paul says, it comes by focusing your thoughts on what is good and true and lovely. There's always something that you could complain about, but a follower of Jesus knows that all of life is a gift and can choose to see beauty and grace in any life circumstance. Which leads Paul to his conclusion. He again thanks the Philippians for their sacrificial gift and he wants them to know that his imprisonments, that his times of poverty, that these are not true hardships for him. They've actually become his greatest teachers, showing him that no matter his circumstances, he has learned the secret of contentment. It's simple dependence on the one who strengthens him. Paul has come to see his own suffering as a participation in the story of Jesus. The letter to the Philippians gives us a unique window into Paul's own heart and mind. He saw his entire life as a reenactment of the story of Jesus. And you can sense in this letter his close connection to Jesus, his awareness that Jesus' love and presence is closer than his own skin. And that's what gave him hope and humility in his darkest hours. And so Paul shows us that knowing Jesus is always a deeply personal transforming encounter. And that's the kind of Jesus that Paul invites others to follow. And that's what Paul's letter to the Philippians is all about. <clears throat> wow. That's why I felt the video would do just the right justice to the outline that I read to you all before uh, before this video. But now it's the time for us to dig a little deeper. 
on some of these aspect which we have seen in the video and Apostle Paul has written in his epistle. That is the theological themes. What theological themes can we draw from this letter? And the first one that we can do is the believer's relationship to Christ. Now, Paul's central concern is the advance of the gospel through which people come into an ongoing relationship with God through Jesus Christ and form a congregation. At the outset, he refers to Jesus Christ to define his own role as his servant, that is Apostle Paul's role as a servant of Jesus Christ. And the Christian status of the readers, as we read it in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, saints in Christ Jesus, he tries to pick up on the Old Testament language to identify them as God's people, showing that they owe this status to their relationship to Jesus Christ, who is named right alongside God the Father as the source of salvation. Now, the significance of Christ for the reader is expressed in the phrase in Christ, that is inclusivity in Christ. Now, it can be a natural complement to a verb such as rejoice or be confident on the basis of Christ or the Lord who he is. Now, Christian conduct should be in the Lord. Our conduct should be in the Lord, determined by the fact that Christ is the Lord of his people and requires a certain manner of behavior from them, certain lifestyle from them, as we read it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 29, and then chapter 4, verse 2. Now, God acts in and through Jesus for the good of his people. Now, the readers have the close relationship with Jesus through their faith in him. So that Paul can say that they are in Christ. This is like the way in which he speaks of believers as a part of the body that belongs to Christ for which he is the head. That's the first theological theme we can bring out. That's believers' relationship to Christ. The second uh, theme is about Christ, humility and exaltation. Now, what kind of person could Jesus be for Paul to talk about him in this astonishing way? How can this person be the channel through whom God operates? A person with whom one can have this kind of spiritual relationship. Yeah. Now he is the person who has existed in the form of God. But he did not regard his equality with God as something to be held on or to be exploited. Now such language said Jesus at the same level of authority as God the Father. The use of the verb being, that is Jesus being of the same nature as God, so that being, and the clear contrast between the original state of Jesus and the, when, and the way in which he then took the nature of the servant and adopted a human likeness and appearances show that Paul is describing pre-existent status of Jesus. When he was with God the Father, before God sent him into the world to be born of a woman and live a human life. Now the ties in with the earlier description of Jesus as one Lord alongside the one God the Father. So here we correlate Christ is one with God. The next theological theme we see is the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> now, Jesus is the dispenser of the Holy Spirit, as we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 33. 
the blessing bestowed by God on his people may be attributed to both to Jesus and to the Holy Spirit. The help given to Paul in his present suffering comes by the spirit of Jesus Christ, as we read in Philippians chapter 1 verse 19. And so, did I cover this in one second? Yeah, so I missed out the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so, he appears that believers should stand firm in one spirit. Sharing in the spirit is strikingly similar to sharing in Jesus Christ. And Christian worshipful service of God takes place through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Next uh, theological theme that we see is God the Father. Now the significant role of Christ and the Spirit should not be allowed to overshadow the place of Father in Paul's theology. Now the later reaches its climax in a statement of the extraordinary generosity of God who acts in Jesus and who acts in Jesus. Throughout the letter, God initiates an action. He initiates an action and is at work in believers' life to protect and overrule in their lives. Then the next concept, uh, theological theme that we see is new life in Christ. Now, the new life in Christ is one of spiritual growth and progress. Now, the reader are to grow in love, knowledge, purity and righteousness right up to the day of Christ. As we read in Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 to 11. Now, the great importance is attached to being blameless on the day when Christ comes. Now, if there is a tension between the statement that believers have nothing to fear on that day, as we read it in Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, and other statement in which growth in holiness is a condition for blamelessness on judgment day, it all disappears when we recognize that God himself will achieve this blamelessness in our life, of his, in, in the life of his people. Because God is faithful and he will do it. So that that uh, whole debate is, we can see here, God has brought to an end saying that he himself will bring that blamelessness in us. Oh, he is faithful and he will do it. Now the term fellowship that we see uh, in, in, in Philippines, Philippians is referred to as koinonia is used for the participation of believers in God's blessing in the Holy Spirit, as we read it in Philippians chapter 1, verse 7 and chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, we see also, we see that participation, it is the participation in the, first is in the God's blessing in the Holy Spirit, the second work of the gospel, and that brings them into a relationship with one another, and it also brings them in relationship with Apostle Paul. Now, such a sharing includes participation in the suffering of Christ. Now, he, bring, he first defines the relationship and then he says, such a participation in the suffering, such sharing include also the participation in the suffering of Christ. But this also carries with it the hope of sharing in his resurrection. Now, on a practical level, the congregation's ongo ongoing work of mission includes supporting Paul's own work through prayer, tangible gift of money, and sending colleagues. It also involves the local activity of striving together for the faith of the gospel and in holding out the word of life. So, as we conclude, what do we see? We see... Philippians shows the way in which Paul understands his own circumstances theologically. So we see Paul's theology in circumstances. We then see a personal relationship of knowing Christ lies at the very heart of Paul's religion. 
So the concept of religion, a brain is a very, at its heart is a relationship. Relationship with God through, through Christ by the Spirit. Now, Christ himself is not only seen as a savior, but he is also seen as a pattern for Christian living. Come, follow me. Do what I do. So he is not just seen as a savior, but is also a pattern of how a Christian should be living. Now, believers must put their confidence for solely in Christ for salvation. We should only put our confidence solely in Christ for our salvation and not in any human achievement. And our life must be conformed to Christ and his cross. So that's how Apostle, Brong, Apostle Paul brings such a level of positivity by correlating his adversaries into a joy. Then defining that adversaries as a way of participation in Christ's suffering. And how that suffering brings joy. And how that joy is celebrated with others in living out a life of faith with each other. So that's about the story today. We'll now take questions. I have to stop sharing. stop here. Okay. So that's about the story So uh, of Apostle Paul's letter to the Christians or the believers in the city of Philippi. So are there any comments or, or clarification that we can answer? Or anything that you could have picked up uh, on how Apostle Paul connected his adversaries being in prison but yet bringing such a joy and then appealing them to live and follow Christ. Well, while others are thinking, uh, the video mentioned uh, that we participate in the story of Jesus. I thought that was a very interesting phrase. Uh, as Christians, disciples, we participate in the story of Jesus. Uh, just a thought people might have does that mean that I have no story of my own? Uh, should my story become Jesus' story or should Jesus' story become my, my life? Uh, do I have a story of my own? Just a thought. <laughs> and I think I would like to hear others what they think about this. Yes, but. Yes, buddy. Bertie, you can speak. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, quoting scriptures, God says we have died in a, 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 in a pertaining to our relationship, our life in Christ. Uh, be imitators, also me as I imitate Jesus Christ. Scripture says, that we have died, you know, our old self has been crucified now, very in bad, we repent, being baptized, and see the gift of the Holy Spirit, and uh, walk in newness of life. That is what we participate in the story of Christ, or in the and or in the merits of Christ. But what I'm trying to say, I'm I'm quoting scripture where it mentions we have died in Christ, and our lives are hidden. We have died, and our lives are hidden in Christ. Uh, with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, I'm still quoting scripture, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, second coming, we shall also appear with him in glory. 
and everybody who has the soap, we Christian brothers and sisters of Christ. Uh, everybody has everybody who has the soap purifies themselves, looking to the Father and Jesus Christ who are pure. Maybe <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, you know, the closeness we have with Christ, we undergo genuine repentance, baptism, we see the genuine Holy Spirit. We are wrapped up in Christ's life, you know. Uh, you know, we all we are a, uh, we are a work in progress and at different levels of conversion, but we all belong to Him, and our eyes are to be on the Lord. And Christ enables us, you know. The Bible says Christ, the Holy Spirit, enables, inspires, empowers us uh, in uh, you know in this walk with Christ, in this new life, newness of life, and guided by the Holy Spirit, coming to know about the Lord, and growing, acknowledging Him as Lord, and uh, you know with the Father's will being fulfilled in our lives. So I thought maybe I'll just I thought can you know that scripture? Can you throw some light on it, uh, Pastor Sachin? Yes, but before as you conclude that, can you then answer what Pastor Dan has asked that as in the video we have seen, we participate in the life of Christ. And as we participate in the story of Jesus, does his story become ours? Does our uh, identity, do we lost our identities? Do we maintain our story? How do we participate? How do you think we participate in the story of Jesus. What is your take? Anybody care to explore more on that? I think it's quite thought provoking. Uh, Participation is the core of what we do in GCA. And so as we participate, I think these are quite important things, right? Basic things. So what do you think? I mean, there are no right or wrong answers. What is your take on it? And then we can build up. Uh, not only participating uh, is uh, the the new life, participating in the new life uh, you know, with Christ. But first and foremost, God has brought us into Christ to partake of Christ. Partake, we are clothed with Christ, we partake of his divine life and nature. And hence, we are enabled, you know, enabled, inspired, and empowered. So long we have other things. The Holy Spirit corrects us. Okay, any time it gives us strength to overcome. And uh, if we're going wrong, he corrects us and leads us. All, all is a participation. And the ministry of Christ, like we all are sharing in, you know, we participate, but uh, Christ is the key. You know, <laughs> the Holy Spirit, the Father's will being accomplished in us. You know, uh, Thank you. Yeah, it involves a genuine, which involves a genuine repentance, a genuine baptism, and a genuine receiving of the Holy Spirit uh, can help us. You know, in our walk, talk with Christ, in our new life in Christ. Pastor Sachin, I think you sharpened the question even better. <laughs> when you say, do we lose our identity when we participate in the story of Jesus? Because there are some philosophies and religious thought that say that ultimately our goal is to merge into the eternal and you lose existence and you become one with the eternal, right? You or, uh, you know, however they put it. Uh, and... Uh, I think the Christian story is very different. Uh, you do not lose your identity, and yet you're identified with Christ. So I think your, uh, you sharpened that question even better. And I think uh, that needs a response. Yeah. So, Mr. <clears throat> Anybody else would like to take uh, their take on that? Okay, so let me take my take on it. Yeah, um, all of us we, we and often in my sermons, I the the foundation that I have always gone into 
when God says, let us make mankind in our own image and in our own likeness, right? So we are made in the image of God to have same nature, but we are, we when we are made in image of God, same nature and characters exist in us, that is to relate and to love and to respond back, correct? So when we respond back, we are one with them, but we do not become God. We are one in that communion that God has extended to us through Christ by the Spirit so that we enjoy that relationship. And because we are made in His image and likeness, we can respond to that offer of a relationship and actually enjoy that relationship. Because otherwise, we would not know how to participate in that. So that's on the spiritual level. Now here, when we say, uh, living his story. We read a lot of places in the Bible where he says the Holy Spirit reveals more about him and our life is transformed. So while our life is transformed, we still remain who we are. Our story still remain who we are. Yet, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we transform and party as we participate with Christ in what he is doing. So we still maintain who we are. But yet that participation activity transform us to make us more like in whose image we were made. But yet I remain very much of who I am. That is Sachin, uh, the flaws I have. But I kept getting transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Is what that is how I would like to take uh, on that. Praveen, I think you can also share and then other will find it encouraging to share as well. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, question where uh, you have pointed to the right place about our creation. Uh, the creation of humans, especially and in marriage, the kind of connection uh, which uh, God explains in Genesis chapter 2 uh, should be considered as an example of our union with God as well. Uh, just as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit Trinity is an example for our our union with God also. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are united, they are one. At the same time, they are distinct. So our union with God in which we are becoming one with Christ and we are distinct in, in our own very being. And uh, one good thing for us is the connection here is this. Uh, our existence is completely dependent on the existence of God. In the life of God, in the love of God, only we find our existence. And uh, we find who we are in the light of who God is. So, when it comes to come to the story, our story, we participate with Jesus. Are we not having any story of our own? Uh, the, the, the Fundamentally, theologically, certain points have to be uh, settled here. Number one is... We cannot find any story for ourselves unless we participate in the story of Jesus Christ. In him only we have the context for our story. That's why Apostle Paul says in him we live, move and have our being. And uh, uh, Apostle Paul also says, uh, I do not have anything to boast about myself except what Christ has done through me. So uh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. These are the statements in which Apostle Paul was completely connecting his story in relation to the story of Christ. In Philippians, Philippians chapter 3 verse 10, I consider as one of the amazing scriptures where he mentions and says that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being confirmed to his death. Here also, I, I, uh, Apostle Paul, he wants to completely identify himself, identify his life, identify his story in the story of Jesus Christ. As much, uh, as much as we are connected, as much as we are participating, as much as we are partaking in the story of Jesus Christ, we will get to see what is our story. Otherwise, we won't get to see our story also because Jesus said, uh, I am the life and uh, he came to give us the life. Without him, we don't have any life. When we don't have any life, we don't have any story. So in order to have any life for ourselves, we should be uh, in the context of the life and the story of Jesus Christ in completion. 
completely we should identify ourselves in the life of jesus and the story of jesus then only will be able to see our lives it is just like writing on the blackboard if you just write oh, with a white shark it won't come without a black background so in the story of jesus uh, we find our story and in the life of jesus we find our life just as in G in god we find our existence so whatever we talk about humans human identity human existence human story all has to be found in the life in the existence in the story of jesus christ and ultimately this is where this the colossians apostle paul says we are <coughs> all things are created by him in him through him and for him and all things should be consisted in him so uh, what we can find is the very purpose of our lives is for jesus so the purpose of our when when our purpose of our life is for jesus our story makes sense or our story will become a story in jesus christ only so in finding that we will be drawing our story <laughs> otherwise there is no story for ourselves we don't have any story for ourselves our story is in the life of jesus in the story of jesus in the story of jesus we find our story so i guess where there is a distinction here out that's why apostle paul uses three interesting i mean themes we can see uh, in philippians one is uh, uh life in christ uh, and then Lie, live, sorry, live in Christ, live like Christ, live for Christ. And uh, these three things he speaks, uh, live in Christ, he's talking about we are in Christ Jesus. He explains about who we are and all. And he talks about uh, live as Christ, chapter 2 and all, be of same mind like Jesus Christ. In other words, that is participating our life with the life of Jesus Christ. And then live for Jesus Christ. When we live in when we live in Christ, when we live as Christ, then we will be able to live for Christ. That's where we have our story also written. That's how. Um, right. Thank you, Praveen. So, if I have to summarize, our true identity is found in Jesus, because in Him is our existence. Correct. And when we find our true identity, then we can when we then we participate because we know our role what we are expected to do, to become more and more like him. So we participate. And in that one, he reveals us our story as we participate in his story. Otherwise, we all of us have name, have story, but the real identity is in him. Real story is living his story. Thank you, Praveen. Yeah. Any other uh take? And of course, when we live his story, uh, I we should never put the surrounding away from us. As much as we are living in his story, we we are also uh, as we as much we are participating in his story. The way of participation is also horizontally. That is, we have to be connected with our family, with our community, with our people. Right, and that it happens. It's not a solo journey. But we'll come back to you if we'll just check if somebody else has any comments they would like to add or reflect and then we'll come back to Bertie. Yes, Mr. Rao? I think you're on mute. If you can just unmute. Ah. Yeah, let Bertie speak. I don't have anything to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Rao, we all won. We all one in Christ, okay? <laughs> now, what I wanted to say is the sentence of we all have proceeded from God, our true God, our true Lord, okay? And Christ came for us, with us, live life without sin. No, he, is the, he is the beginning of the new creation. He has remade us in the purpose for which God created, as Pastor Praveen said. We are made, let us make man in our way, image after our life. My point is, we have proceeded from God, uh, and people have gone astray, have gone, you know, taken for themselves to decide what is right and evil. And God said, you have to make a choice, and you know, 
to go after idols, the void, trying to fill the void and other things. But we are we are right on the path. You know, we are we know who we are, whom we are believing, how we are saved, and now we just <laughs> the Lord said, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and my father is the gardener, you know. He's a is attached to me. He bears much fruit. And here is my father glorified that he bear much fruit. For apart from me can do nothing, you know, all that. So we are connected to him. We have identity to him, which will always give us the true uh, joy and peace. Because apart from that, uh, we can get, you know, uh, we can get uh, what do you call that? Uh, troubled, we can get uh, misunderstood. And other. But God, Very true. Uh, thankfully, in the Holy Spirit is, you know, yeah. in work in each of us. Yeah. He is that foundation. He is the denominator which gives us the value. If you do not have yeah. a denominator, it reaches nowhere. Thank you all for your very valuable input. I just want to use the, the rest of the time to pray for uh, Mr. Rao as he go for a treatment tomorrow. Yeah, Pastor Sachin, uh, one second, please. Yes. Pastor Sachin. Yes, sir. Ms. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Very yeah. loud and clear. Uh, sir, I, uh, uh, I want to make a general observation. Yes, sir. Bible topics should shall be advanced, shall be announced one month in advance. You may take it up at any sequence, in any, any particular sequence. But now, see, we are coming to the to the class, and now we are take uh, we are not coming prepared. It's like Greek and Latin bouncing off my head. <laughs> Point uh, I taken know, noted. I, I don't know whether my suggestion makes good. Eh? No, absolutely okay because we have put that in the last uh, newsletter that by mid of this year we will complete what we are continuing which is like me continuing the survey of the new testament pastor praveen doing this and this but however what we will do is we would also publish it in the on the whatsapp group once in a while so that people are aware uh, what are our plans noted no, uh, next month's uh, topic shall be advanced shall be announced in advance so that people now uh, a few who are interested will come prepared and they will ask questions. Absolutely. We would love a very healthy participation so that ah, yes, sir. we yes, can sir. That learn is my... together. Absolutely. Noted. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, may I add another to what uh, Elder uh, Poppins uh, mentioned? Come, you, uh, tell us in advance so we come prepare questions and all. I also suggest that if you beforehand, just like just like as you'll announce what we're going to talk on, and as we are the normal a uh, normal particip particip normal participants, you could even mention like it could be more interactive if we could. I'm just suggesting. Oh. Sure, buddy. <laughs> okay. I think we'll check. But yes, very valid points. And if all uh, of these preparation brings uh, us a very healthy participation, by all means, we should do it. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, Bertie, I'll check up with you later. And we'll also consider that into our uh, change. So at this moment, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to tell you that uh, your continuous participation encourages us a lot, uh, number one. Number two, it also helps us to go dig deeper, digger, deep, dig deeper and deeper and deeper that what if, okay, Mr. Rao asked me this question, I have to prepare like this. When it comes to history, I have to be very careful. Nobody can touch Mr. Surya Murthy's eyes. That happened there, that happened there, so I need to make sure that that is there. Mr. Franklin probably brings his one. So it is such an encouragement when you bring your, your tenets, your, your inputs that helps us to study uh, together and also help us to improve. So I want to thank you. And now let's uh, uh, spend time uh, to pray for Mr. Rao, who will go uh, a treatment tomorrow. And also we'll submit rest of us uh, into God's hand. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, what a joy and a pleasure and a blessing to come together and read your word, O oh Lord, and wait for your Holy Spirit to reveal us who you are and reveal us, O oh Lord God, that how we should respond. And what a love it is, O oh Lord, that you share with us who you are and Lord, that helps us to understand and then implement it in our lives, in the lives of our loved ones. 
So thank you for this time and this medium and for GCI to, to bring and help us to bring such subjects, O oh Lord God. And we continue to pray that, Lord, through your spirit, let our life be transformed and be more and more like you, O oh Lord. And as we learn today, our identity is in you, O oh Lord God. Our Father, we also uh, at this point bring Mr. Rao to your throne of grace and mercy as he will go undergo treatment tomorrow. Lord, we pray for your favor on the doctors uh, and the attending staff. And Lord, we pray for a successful treatment. We pray that your presence there be there and your hand of restoration, healing, comfort, protection be upon Mr. Rao. Once again, Lord, thank you. We submit ourselves into your hand, Lord. Take care of us. And thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. Thank you and bless you. Give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Very good evening. And we... Sorry, what happened? I ran out of charge. <laughs>